Um, the, the, the theme tonight is, is about health. Um, more than 85% of Canadians use a car to get to work, a fact that comes with significant repercussions, not just for the environment, but also for the healthcare sector as well. That's because, an inact, uh, that's because inactive commuting, along with uh, inactive lifestyles, uh, contributes to a whole host of physical ailments, from obesity to heart disease. Here in Toronto, we have a, the statistics are a little bit more favorable here. It's about 70% take the car, a little bit more, um, about 20% about 20, 20 take transit, Adam, was that, remember that from your days? About 25%. About 25%. And then you, know, you have 3, 4, 5%, depending on the weather, taking their bikes or, or, or walking. Um, so, so, you know, we're a little bit better in this city. I think Edmonton is the, the worst Canadian city in terms of public transportation. I think uh, uh, I think it's less than 20%. I think it's around 18% take it, where 82% uh, uh, drive. So, um, we're ahead of some of uh, the other cities in Canada, but not, not nearly as close as we are to other international cities. Um, so that, tonight, we're going to hear from uh, uh, two of the two Chevette teams that sought to answer this, this following question. How can we make active transportation a viable alternative uh, to our communities? Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce them to you now, or our panel now. So uh, first up is Paul Bedford. Paul right there, is the uh, adjunct professor of city planning at U of T and Ryerson. Uh, Adam Giovanni uh, is the, uh, he's a special advisor to the president of the Metropolitan Transportation Agency in Montreal and president of the Toronto chapter of Certified Institute of Logistics and Transport. Um, he's also the former chair of the TDC and former city councilor. Jennifer Kiesman is the chief planner for the city of Toronto for all of 40 hours now, is that what it is? Not quite. No, okay, so not even there yet. So, um, you can't blame her for anything yet. <laughs> uh, we're not going to blame her for anything. Uh, and uh, Nancy Smith Lee is here with us. She's the director of the Toronto Center for Active Transportation, also known as, 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 as TCAT. So uh, the, first, uh, the first presentation is from Lou Carp Dye, and it will be Connor uh, Malloy and Todd Smith. Uh, Connor is the operations manager for Green Homes Limited, and Todd is a landscape architect at IBI in Toronto. So, it's up to you guys. Good evening. Thanks for coming. I'm Connor Malloy. This is this is Todd. Tonight we're going to be talking about a challenge, which is low carb diet. It's to bring active transportation to market. Not to bring it to, but how do we encourage more of it to create healthy lifestyles? So as a group, we started with a three-day presentation. Sorry, one-day presentation and a three-day shred. We came up with the ideas you see tonight. And Todd and I, in a small group worked for a few months to create the exhibit, which you might see. Uh, so what we started with was our challenge to create healthy lifestyles through our transportation in the market. Hence the low-carb diet. So you might ask, why market? It's prime candidate for thinking about after transportation. It was one thought, at least my thinking, maybe others, as a bit of a better community, but it's now a full-fledged city with a large population of 3,000 people. And it's one of Canada's fastest growing cities. So, the current population is 300,000 people, and as the fastest growing city, by 2040, it's expected to grow by 150,000 people and 100,000 jobs. Now, presently, roads are already congested during peak times. You know, that starts early now, it's six inches late, it's a nine for people doing sort of flex hour programs. I think it started to get early as 3 30 and end at 6. So, really, you're only kind of creating a small window in the middle of the day that gives it congested, uh, especially as it picks Old Markham with Highway 7, 401, and 148. And the big number to think about is 180,000. Every day in Markham, 180,000 trips are made within the city that could be walked or biked. So, those are trips that are less than half an hour, the majority of those are 50 minutes, and they could be one or two kilometers away. But based on the current mindset and the instruction of the city, you are the easiest and the most uh, typical uh, choice to make is, is, is to drive. So the curb mode share is single drivers represent 60 per, 262 percent of the modes, or sorry, of the trips made within the city and out of the city. Fifty percent of those are driven by two people or more. Eight percent take transit. Eight percent walk and 3% take the go, and 4% is other. So much lower than Toronto, and when you think
think about Mark being a commuter city, including for Toronto, 3% is a very small number for those who actually take a go service in the city. But with Go, although you're taking a sort of a green measure downtown, it's really that last mile where you look at those users of most stations in Markham, this is Mount Joy. 81% live less than three kilometers away. And actually, more than half of that live within one kilometer away. But two thirds of those people drive to the station and park there. And the other metric for determining how active the population is is how their kids act and, and get around. So in 1986, 53% of kids went to school. And now it has dropped to 36. And that's not to say that the population is so large that kids are walking long distances. Most of these couple sacs are built around schools for the purpose of you know, getting close to physical safety. So again, how do we encourage active transportation? The solution is not as simple as adding bike lanes. This is something that I know people think about, they just say, you know, we'll just add bike lanes and make wider sidewalks, but it's really it's a combination of public consultation its policies, programs, and its planning. So what we require, and Mark requires, is a rigorous transportation redesign. And what we could take from that is really looking at a large-scale concept of a complete street, where you share the right of way for all modes and all people. So what we'd like to create is a complete government, but really a complete city. So what our approach was, we looked at four different site typologies within Markham that are represented the most uh, towns, even hamlets, and cities around Ontario and Canada. Those included a residential street, a busy intersection, a mobility hub, and a commercial street. We then identified four types of users within uh, Markham. And those were kids, age 16 to 18, Adults and seniors, we decided to break up adults into two groups to identify two types of users, those that commute and take make trips within the city, and those that make trips outside of the city. So we believe that complete cities must have a place for all people and all those transportation. And cities have the capability of providing something for everybody, only because and only when they're created by everybody. So we think that street should be designed by kids, seniors, adults, and really everyone who lives in the community and access and go through the community, uh, not just transportation planners. So that street's going to be a safe place for walking, cycling, and really all modes, and not just for cars. So the first typology we looked at was residential streets. And we chose one in a very typical cul-de-sac, about 15 streets built around a, a public school. And what you see in this particular area is fairly wide streets. Where there's no sidewalks. Most drivers have four cars in them. And there's additional street parking for the overflow. And you see no kids outside walking or, or biking or anything. We spoke to some local residents, and most of them could actually divide. You would think that they would have wanted sidewalks, and this is something the developers skipped. But most of them actually chose the street because there were no sidewalks, which allowed them to forego shoveling and also allowed you to park two more cars in your driveway. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's systemic because their kids who go to the school three blocks away are now driven to school. And the parents who wouldn't have their kids walk feel a little uneasy with their kids walking with so many cars, so they now drive them as well. And now we're in the school, which is only three blocks away from the street, you have 200 cars lining up at the end of the day and buses, so even kids who live across the road are driven because of a fear of walking between cars and buses. So this is a common theme that came up in spoke to us. And uh, I'll have to walk you through our proposed uh, solution for this group. Good evening. So our, our retrofit of this street um, focused on a number of issues that acting together would make a kid feel like, hey, yeah, I can watch the no problem, and the kids feel, or the parents feel that the kid is safe, their kids are safe. These factors are what we focused on, but certainly not limited to reflective lines along the sidewalk, a vegetated or different paver treatment buffer separating where the kids are walking to delineate and demarcate the difference. Uh, lowering the speed limit to 40 from 50, 
creating um, lay-by parking with guards in front so that cars don't feel like it's a free-for-all um, along a, a street where there are likely kids biking uh, or walking. And the walking school bus you see, which is a theme um, that really went throughout our idea of getting a community to work together to, to, uh, for this initiative. So looking at this uh, in plan view, we see we divided it into implementation stages, uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, uptake is, is likely over a period of years contingent upon um, education campaign, new habits, um, policy planning, so that a few um, gregarious residents take up the call, go knock on other people's doors and say, hey, can we get a group together and meet at this stop, at this star here, and then kids can watch school together. I'm not teaching you what I want in school bus is, I'm sure you can figure it out. And it's in, active in a lot of different cities, but we felt that in this particular suburban development around which the whole uh, uh, development is around a school that it could really work. Uh, later, years two to four, that you could start to implement uh, speed bumps and the agitated or paved buffer that separates and makes uh, the place where kids or bikes are feel like it's their area and they don't need to, to worry about cars. Um, and then long term, uh, perhaps rethinking the way the network, the street network occurs in, in changing a lot of two ways to one way um, so that there's less traffic and there's predictable traffic direction. Um, planting trees obviously and planting them well, um, you choosing the right tree and share bike lanes. So that was uh, the ideas that we had for a residential street and those situations are, are very typical of um, developments within the last 15 years that are focused on the car, but we do feel like um, with a lot of different implementation we could change that. So the car will give you the existing condition for the next one. So now I'm going to look at a major intersection. This is Highway 7 and Road. It's a fairly large intersection. I'm sure we go through most of these daily. Um, and the challenge here is that intersections like this one and others around it are designed for the use of the car only. So the north-south road is six lanes. It feeds the 407 just to the south. Although just a block to the north, feeds into Old Markham, it across the historical district. It goes into two lanes. And it crosses Highway 7, which is eight lanes across. You have schools on the other side of the road. You have a park on the far side of the road. But really, there's the challenge here as well is no one lives around these areas. It's not really a known that you would notice as you go down Young Street, see these big nodes of developments where you have people living and commuting and accessing shops and retailers and amenities. So what you have really is just a large um, intersection for cars to get through and go north, south, east, west. And what we found, speaking to people on site, was that they really wanted to sort of uh, pedestrianize the intersection. There are increased levels of uh, pedestrians and people wanting to, to bike. Um, it is quite dangerous as you go down Highway 7. And it was having uh, thoughts from people as we spoke to commuters, people waiting for the bus and drivers is that they, they like to see traffic levels, like congestion times, uh, maintained or reduced, but increased mode shapes. And uh, talk about the future of strategies. We really wanted to present our vision as scaling down the feeling of one of these intersections. I'm sure we've all tried to cross them, and sometimes it's hard to make it all the way across in the time you're given. We wanted to scale it down with a bunch of different uh, design strategies to a human scale and a human time frame. So if we zoom in, we see that this um, former major intersection uses density, uses signage to the right, uses um, very identifiable and obvious crosswalks. Um, the guard at the corner, which makes people feel like it's maybe their space, they've sort of taken back that part of the intersection to do what they need to do to negotiate how they're moving through it. Density uh, right up to the street line is crucial. Um, if, you're, if you're wanting to create a place where you can create a streetscape and feel like the human scale is uh, thought about and considered and that it creates an opportunity for the first 50 feet, um, which is crucial also in feeling like 
Uh, it's not just about cars moving around, but there's a place for all modes of transportation. <coughs> and the Viva Metrolinks, um, the, the BRT that's actually starting to unroll uh, along Highway 7 near Bayview will eventually make its way over to this intersection and this integrated transport hub will provide a way of, um, of having your bike, getting on BRT, going somewhere and getting off with your bike, uh, a dedicated lane. Uh, it's really, for me and the group, felt like this uh, has the potential to create a new suburban boulevard typology um, that could be really amazing. So looking at it in plan, in the first little bit, at this intersection, there's a really great recreation area just south, but there's no signage or pathway to get there, so we wanted to, to try to create a context um, by directing people to that, increase the, the walk times, and make obvious the crosswalks. Uh, the next phase would be uh, the connectivity of these bike lanes, so making it very obvious and very thorough that that is a lane unto itself. Um, and the mixed use densities, as I said, built right to the street line. Uh, some tree planting that um, echoes recreational and naturalized areas beyond so that it feels like uh, the area isn't cordoned off, but rather that natural systems and man-made systems, um, woman-made systems have a place in all of these um, different areas. And finally, long-term implementation with acknowledging the, the BRT in the future is that they have these transit islands that are very generous of space. You feel like you can negotiate what you need to do and get safely on and off. Different paving colors and textures to announce uh, the center as uh, an area of exchange and intersection and movement that all different types of transportation are occurring here. The next step we looked at was the Mural Festival building up. And what we chose to look at was the Mount Joy Go Station. It's at the north end of uh, Marble Road at Borough. And what you see here is really, it's really a large parking lot with, with a station. The challenge here is, is really to look at how other folks can access the site. Typically, as we said, the uh, majority of residents who use the site, 81%, live within three kilometers. I think 50% of those live within one kilometer. But you have a model share or two thirds actually drive to the site and park uh, because they're encouraged to do so. It's a site that has free parking. It's a site that is bought adjacent properties. The site across the tracks and also to the south where they demolish buildings and, and the largest parking lots. So I think the parking lot number is between uh, 3,500 and 4,000 spots. And although you think it's convenient to drive those you know, two kilometers, which might take you a minute, um, if you stand in the farthest spot, which I did, and you walk to the platform, it's five minutes and 20 seconds, which to me is not convenient. If you had a better way to bike or walk and a place you could store your bike in a sort of storage facility with amenities. And uh, the other telling design which shows you how the modes are prioritized. The closest spot to that station is actually a free parking spot. It's not a, you know, a, a as a car or a shared car or even a spot for someone who has reduced uh, mobility, it's just a standard parking spot and it's six feet from the six feet from the station. And the bike parking is stuck behind that. You also have cars pouring through the station where buses are trying to get through and people are walking through, so it's not the safest place to park. So the challenges here are sort of global and it's looking at uh, multiple programs and policies and, and consultation. So quite apart from the intersection that we just saw where cars are going to be for the foreseeable future, these GO stations that are uh, hoping to be increasingly used and you know, they have non-stop daily service, this is an amazing opportunity to, um, to style this into a mobility hub where people feel like all forms of mobility are um, accounted for and thought of and designed for. Um, and you see that there's a dedicated bus lane so that the buses have a dedicated lane. They're not competing with cars to get um, 20, 50 times the amount of people into the station. So we're really deprioritizing the car. You're welcome to bring your car. We also uh, thought about paid parking and doing parking garages. 
many of which are actually being built as part of new go stations across Ontario, uh, either as part of an existing development or in concert with mixed use. So we acknowledge that probably people drive their car to the station because they want to pick their kids up after or they want to pick up some groceries after. You think about the, the life, the, the daily goings on. And so we imagine that these mobility hubs also become uh, a venue for retail, pop-up shops, uh, community events, farmers markets, so that you don't just go and get, get the train, but it becomes a whole mixed use scenario. I remember living in Tokyo and how their uh, stations are just incredible. That, that was the hub and the node of the community and everything you needed was right by the train. So you see um, the dedicated bike lane, the bike, really cool, sexy bike storage. You don't have to leave your bike out in the winter. You can, you know, uh, rent space, rent a locker. It's going to be there when you get back. And then beyond and above, you see the uh, idea of density and mixed use of live, work, retail at the bottom. Uh, again, I talked about that first 50 feet to create that mise-en-scene for humans to feel that their scale is being acknowledged. So in plan view, we start uh, by, when it's appropriate, making room for seasonal vendors so that people think, oh yeah, this is just a train station, I can actually you know, get something here and learn about my community or meet someone. Um, and paid parking, that's no brainer. Uh, to rezone the area, to include uh, provision for this inclusionary zoning and the covered bike storage. So you see how the the station uh, is becoming surrounded by a different way of thinking about um, a mobility hub, that there's lots of different things happening. And friendly long term with density at the corner of Markham Road and Borough, that that would provide for uh, hopefully a critical mass of users and residents that would make use of all the different provisions and activities and events, um, different crosswalk and junction design, um, a new ghost station building actually to, to present it as a landmark in the landscape. The well, last of all we looked at was the commercial street and the one we selected was it's Main Street, so what you call Old Barnum. It's uh, four lanes. The two outside lanes are used as uh, parking, and the middle two lanes is used as the thoroughfare. The outside lanes are free parking all day, and the middle two lanes are used as a thoroughfare. So although this space actually accesses a sort of a, um, an egress to, to Highway 7, which is a large, um, it creates a lot of congestion, Although there's four lanes, only two lanes are actually used to move cars around. So the biggest thing here is really is redividing the space that works for all modes. It's moving that parking away from away from the street and putting it behind the buildings that you see in Unionville and other towns, cities. And using that additional space to widen the sidewalks for seniors and for, for youth and um, the patios and, and bike lanes and, and talking about the through them. So here, the human scale is given to you by the scale of buildings and the storefronts. And so you build upon that uh, existing context to imagine how, yes, you need it as a traffic artery at certain times of the day, but that also by rethinking parking, that you don't need free parking on the street, that's maybe two eighties for these days, um, that we need to really think about what is this street and how many different people need to use it. So signage, uh, uh, definite pavement markings and wider markings for seniors that may live closer to the core and want to have an experience of walking around the core. Uh, as you see here, this is our idea of a complete street, bi-directional bike lanes, um, and no parking on the main street, but rather parking behind. <coughs> and also signage here as well. So in plan view, you start out maybe doing a trial in the summer, uh, just like Young Street did with the planters. You just see how, what sort of uptake, how many people use it, 
uh, and that gives you a sense. You talk to the merchants and assure them that even though they, they won't have parking, that it's actually a misnomer that it decreases business on King Street and Kitchener. It's increased business. They have a new uh, complete street design recently there. Uh, a bit further along, uh, we only have parking 10 to 3 on Monday to Friday. We have car-free Sundays. You're just sort of trying different things and seeing how the community reacts um, and how it would affect policy. And then in the future, it's this is an uh, elevation of the perspective I showed you. So that you have lay-by bollard parking so that a car can come along and sneak in to park, but it's not taking up a whole lane for parking. Rather, it's sort of in amongst um, the lane that it has. And that the mixed use densities and buffers are all, as I said before, trying to um, affect a more human scale and uh, make it a beautiful and inviting place that you don't think, uh, I'm not welcome here or I can't go here, but that you don't even think twice about it. So, Connor and I do believe, uh, after months of, you know, we're not transportation planners or engineers, uh, but we do have a you know, strong philosophy that these sorts of things aren't an overnight sensation, but that uh, habits just need to be challenged and questioned and um, proposition new way, ways of thinking about getting around and, and that uh, your health shouldn't be a remedial thing, but should be a great byproduct of you going about your daily activities. Thanks.
So a few people. Uh, how many, about a third of the room maybe. How many people here consider themselves active transportation advocates? You, 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 you've drunk the Kool-Aid, you're there. So maybe about half the people in the room. Um, how many people in the room feel that we need to have a big conversation about how we live in the city of Toronto, just because we do have Torontonians? Oh good, because I'll make a little announcement at the end of the evening that I think will make you happy. <laughs> Um, the first question that I want to ask is about is about consultation, and it comes from the beginning of the presentation. You talk about the importance of involving everyone in creating their own streets, involving kids, involving adults, uh, involving users, and then you gave us an example where residents chose a street precisely because it didn't have sidewalks. And I just want to have, I would like to hear you comment on this contradiction. Because the reality is, those people chose a street that didn't, in fact, have active transportation. So when you talk about having a really inclusive design process, I think you're talking about maybe only involving some people. And it just raises real tension for us that I think behooves us to think really carefully about when we talk very broadly about the merits of, of consultation, when we do feel that there are well, about half of them put their hands up and said they were advocates for active transportation. Um, when some of us in the room actually do think that a certain kind of outcome is better than another. Is that a doozy? No. <laughs> uh, well, I think that's a challenge for almost any of the other lives where we have to make a decision. You see this in the states with you know, sugar drinks on the bottom. He's trying to make a decision for the masses, which will hopefully reduce you know, heart disease and all these illnesses, which causes the taxpayer money, but there are residents who choose, who choose to live that way, choose those for instance, in that lifestyle. And I think you're already going to have that. I think that um, the challenge for places like Martin, let's keep it on point for, say, residential streets and parents choose a street with no sidewalks, is I think it's a bit of, as much as the consultation is also about education, so it's educating them on the, the sort of pros and, and negatives of choosing a street with no sidewalks. There's also educating developers on offering a street with the sidewalks in the first place. Um, you know, I think it's uh, and it's really it's a, it's a uh, systemic thing. The people who chose the street because of no sidewalks, it was because of I think very selfish reasons. It's because they don't want to shovel snow. These are very able-bodied young families, and the fact they have two more cars in front of them, four cars. So I think it's it's challenging people. It's about education, and. I think the way you, you get things in motion is you rather deal with the masses, that's quite difficult, is you deal with uh, workers and, uh, and, and, and advocacy groups, and really, if you have a thought to make, really speak up and, uh, and let you sit there. I know in the, in the city of Toronto, the walking strategy, there was a specific part about uh, making connections of those. It was like the, the goal was that every street that didn't have a sidewalk, at least one side of the street would eventually Get a, a get a sidewalk, and then and then the other part was that there was a number of sidewalks that start and then abruptly end somewhere because of some some weird reason that, that we, we we have no idea. And so continuing that type of that type of thing. So what we'll probably could work on something like Markham is actually just you know enhancing a policy that at least you have to have a sidewalk on one side of the streets, like something along those lines. Or or you just you just have a give and take. You can choose those sidewalks. So you have to invest in that program. You know, if you don't want to buy a mode share to work, then if you pay a certain tax or to you know help fund programs that encourage that those kinds of modes, I think that's important. On the flip side of all that too is can you imagine saying we're gonna have no road for cars? Right? It, 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 that seems like a bizarre notion, we're just gonna have a sidewalk. And, and so flipping that around and showing people the kind of the, the kind of silliness of, of saying, well, we're not gonna have a road, is the same reason why you don't say we're not gonna have a sidewalk mm -hmm. as well. Well, I mean, there's ways you can do it. If you look at our strategy for sort of renovating those existing streets, we weren't taking away from people's land and giving it to so their property or their, you know, their, their right here. Taking the road space. It takes up road space. So, you know, you work with the existing drainage. The strategies are easier and less cost effective or costly to actually implement. And it's a way to sort of share. Uh, Adam. Well, great. I found it really interesting, and I wanted to focus on two different areas. One of them, I wanted to sort of get your comments on the on the use of temporary method, um, methods. I saw your slide up where you convert took the residential street on one side, and then on the other one, you sort of had the bike path or, or sorry, the walking this uh, 
path off of because it wasn't sort of an elevated sidewalk. And you know, it strikes me, and I, I was struck by this when I was walking past the Sherburne bike lane the other day, and they we ripped up the entire road. We're putting down a whole new base, and yet in a lot of places they found more creative, cheaper solutions to go ahead and do these things. They also have the advantage of being able to be potentially temporary, or you can discuss, you can move them more incrementally. So I wanted to sort of get your sense on how you saw moving out of the plan in a more temporary fashion, something that wouldn't have to do, rip up the whole road, put in a new sidewalk, that could be great, but it's incredibly expensive. I think uh, the last couple of years, they were putting in like the equivalent of like six or 700 meters of sidewalk just because it's literally, it's in the city of Toronto, because it's so expensive to go in there and just lay a sidewalk if that's all you're gonna do, and otherwise you have to wait for the next uh, rebuild of the road, which could be 30 years down the road. And you reference that, you'd have to wait for that. The other thing I wanted to touch on, just to give you, you know, get two points and let you respond, is you talked a lot about building parking um, and in terms of the GO train at the station as you were looking to transform it. Um, and that really is interesting to me because you know, the, well, at TDC we started charging for parking. Uh, we found that there was actually no reduction in ridership. People switched to the bus uh, to make those short trips that you made or that you were referring to. And at the cost of 40, 50, 60,000 dollars a spot, actually, for the same number of riders, you could literally actually build a subway at that cost for riders attracted. It's so expensive to build and maintain them. You made that decision to actually say we're going to take, you know, uh, flat parking on that. Cheap six, seven thousand dollars a spot, and we're going to spend. I mean, I know you didn't have specific budgets, but we're going to go in and spend this money. And you're right, the province is spending 150 million on parking um, to attract relatively few riders. So I was wondering why you chose that. And then I know your your project didn't necessarily. I, I don't know all the parameters. I sat in on one of the groups for part of the move sessions, but in terms of not just infrastructure, but of course you have that plan. So you can build those uh, new bus lanes, but if you don't provide local bus service to get people as maybe as, a, um, as an alternative to parking, you don't, it doesn't necessarily work out a beautiful bu uh, bus lane, but it actually, you have very few buses and you still have the issue of how do people get to the station. So I was wondering if you could, those two points, it'd be interesting to see your, or hear your response to those. Sure. <clears throat> So, on a residential street, uh, a certain area becomes a neighborhood where people know each other, or they look at what other people do, or they take their cues from neighbors. And so, at the same time that we were trying to be completely optimistic and dreamy, we also realized that uh, we're not just going to tell people how to change. We're going to you know, try to uh, rethink an environment so that the cars can't just speed through and that so they might slow down. And so when, when you do that sort of a at grade, same grade, um, I think that cars think, maybe they think to slow down more because it's at the same grade and that the road is not just all about them going through. Um, so I think that at the same time we try to educate as designers, we also have to, it's a push and pull with how the community reacts and responds. Uh, and I think a good point is about developers that it should, they should have um, sidewalks there to begin with and wider. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that answered a question, but those were the ways that we thought about the residential street. Yes, but, uh, I mean, the further to that, the way we kept it, I think, to your point about silence being expensive, I think if you look at investing in children's futures as a bit of investment, the way that it's built right now is if we don't build sidewalks, we don't invest that money. We have kids that are six, seven now being driven to school every day. When they hit 16, they'll get the G1. When they get 17, they'll buy a car. And the only way to know you're around is by driving, which puts further tax on roads, which is a that expense, they might be less active in their life because they're conditioned to use a vehicle, and it's that systemic cost of, of not investing. And there's ways that you, we are fortunate to have someone from the original planning on our team that sort of kept us on the ground and not in the sky from you know, building sidewalks and raising sidewalks and 
you know, I think using strategies like on Sherborn, it's not a raised platform. They just they're building that curve so that the drain still works, right? So they're not ripping up the sewers and. Right. I was just like, instead of they're they're building a curve, there's yeah. other things that they do much more temporary fashions. Literally, yeah. have to put well, yeah, like you, you can mine them for the first, you do a test case, two streets, and you just put in um, um, boulders, like you see on some of the bridges that we're doing. You put in 40 boulders, you can remove them in the wintertime, so if you are going to drive your kids, try for two years, see how it works, and then go for a long-term investment. But I think you're right, it's really about staging. It's not just about spending money. Because you also need to educate as you're developing that sort of infrastructure. It can't be just as we said in the first line, but just putting in bike lanes or sidewalks. It's sort of a sort of holistic approach to you know, adapting the way people live. I think Jennifer wants to jump in with a quick question there. Yeah, well, just a quick comment that um, the the other extreme, the building the infrastructure, and I had the same reaction as Adam, which was that's great. It's a really low density area. You're never going to find the resources to, to build in a residential neighborhood in that way. It's simply not pragmatic. The other option is around um, policy and incentives and awareness. And in fact, you've got a lot of infrastructure there already in the existing road that is highly underutilized by the local traffic. That asphalt is in the wear out based on the local cars driving on it. So the infrastructure is there already. And finding ways to actually work with the community to focus on the streets as shared spaces. The street I live on, which isn't too far from here, um, and we put up pylons on the street so the kids can play hockey on the street. Don't tell anyone, but we do. Um, this street becomes this shared space, and there's kind of an expectation in the neighborhood. If you're taking a shortcut through our block and you see a pylon, you're going to have to slow down and you're going to have to go around it. No one has to build any infrastructure to create that kind of culture. And I think there's an opportunity for neighborhoods to take that ownership of the infrastructure that exists, and you don't really need to build anything. You actually, it's more of a public, public awareness. And uh, I think we need to think in terms of those kinds of solutions in environments where there already has been a significant investment in infrastructure. Just that asphalt alone, given the density levels in those neighborhoods, is a lot of capital per house already. So I think thinking kind of out of the box in terms of how we share spaces moving forward is a real opportunity. No, I think that's great. Because you can imagine getting cul-de-sacs, sort of that center of 40 feet. It's, it's a large turn rate, so it's not really used. And it's, it's a larger, it's a smaller scale version of what you see in New York, where they're taking public plazas and really just put big sort of rocks and uh, the large stones at the entrance to those plazas, and then change nothing. The pavement's not changed. They've built some, some public seating and some public you know, street cars, and those are now sort of replaying public spaces. And uh, it's maybe a little more cost effective way to approach it. Also, thanks. Okay, thanks uh, very much for your presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, but I'm going to be a bit critical because uh, all this stuff, is, they're all great ideas, but I've heard it for the last 20 years. And so my question is more in terms of what is it going to take to actually make some of this stuff happen in the transformation? I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, if you go on Highway 7 and you go up Highway 400, you know, Notwithstanding everything we know about sustainability, transit, all this great stuff, right? It's business as usual. It's subdivisions galore. It's three, two, three, four car families, as you said. No transit. It is big box retail. It is all auto, auto uh, dependent, right? So my, my sort of question is, you know, I've seen official plan policies throughout this region that contain all the right words, but there's no action. To make them happen. So I got a couple of thoughts here. I'll throw them out, and maybe you guys can respond. Uh, I agree. Uh, Jennifer made the comment about a public discussion. We need a public conversation, and I would call it about choices and consequences. People forget there's a consequence to every choice you make, and the choice of building the way we built out there is a huge consequence because it's very hard to readapt and refit those subdivisions. You know what are you going to do? But you know, houses in the in the backyards. Are you going to increase the height? Are you going to have uh, you know uh, two or three units in each house? Whatever. I don't know. But there's issues along those lines. So a public conversation about choices and consequences, I think, is essential. The second theme that I would talk about is my experience as being the former chief planner, and so having Jennifer as the new chief planner, is is that we got to make it personal. 
So what is it, what's it going to do, these things, for your daily life? Everybody sitting in this audience, your mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, what's going to change in your daily life? You have to get the people on the daily life cycle and convince them that a whole series of changes, whatever they may be, are going to improve their daily life experience through more choices, like the examples. In terms of, if you're taking that GO train, right? Now, as many people know, the GO train service is only rush hour from the birds, except the late short line, right? And that's hourly. Well, what if you had a GO train every 15 minutes all day long, north, south, east, west, throughout the whole region? What if it was electrified? Which, when I was on the Metro Lakes board, I championed electrification. But again, talk is cheap. So, you know, those are some of the issues. And I think we need a huge transformation. And it's got to come from the people as opposed to top down. Uh, so, so that's the second point. The, the third thing I, I wrote down here is in terms of, I always find it incredibly uh, frustrating is the right word. We have great examples of good urbanism right here in Toronto. It's called the streetcar suburbs. You know, when, when we know where all the streetcar routes go in Toronto, when all those those uh, uh, subdivisions or housing developments were built, they were built with a streetcar right up front at enough density to support a viable streetcar service. I'm going to give you one figure, and Adam will relate to this. Uh, this always blows me away. The, the Finch Avenue bus, as an example, carries about, I think, 42,000 riders a day. The whole goddamn Shepherd subway carries 47,000 riders a day, right? The, the, if you add up all of Toronto's streetcar routes in total, the number of people carry, it is double what the entire GTA GO system carries, and all the trains and all the buses. The power of streetcars and, 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 and good bus service is incredible. So I, I, I've got all kinds of stuff here I can say, but I just want to throw those sort of notions. My real question of all this is, What's the strategy to change, to do the transformation? How are we going to do this? Because I think, I think, frankly, we're just tinkering, and we're not really having any impact. Twitter and hope. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. I, my, my presentation was infused with hope. I, I agree. I'm just trying to make it happen. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think I do agree with anything you say. I, I feel your frustration. I feel frustrated every day. Um, you know, I'm not just a cyclist or a walker or a, a driver. I use all of these things, and um, I, I don't know how to change the system. You know, I do work with Cycle Toronto. We do a bit of advocacy, and you know, just to get a Shero along Strawn Avenue, or get another crosswalk across Lakeshore, which which connect with the bike path and market the trail. It takes years of traffic studies and. So I don't know how it, how it really changes overnight. And part of it is infrastructure that either is too expensive to change. Like the issue with the, the GO trains is that GO service shares the rails with CN, is my understanding. They're in the process of untying those lines so they can run trains during the daytime, independent of CN or CP. But until they get there, that's, that's like 10 years away, we won't see that through the day. So it's, I mean, it's hard for those people who work on flex hours to, to do it. So I don't, can I mean, just, Obama? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add, I mean, you know, to pick up on Paul's part, we, we talk a lot about look to other cities and we sort of sometimes get really down on ourselves in Toronto. And yet, when we actually look at the numbers, you know, you can pick your, mo your favorite major and you think, wow, Paris is such an amazing metro system. Portland has an amazing bike system. And, and, they, and then when you look at the actual numbers, you know, there are, the car ownership in France even in the greater Paris region, it's not dramatically different than the GTA. Italy, I mean, some, and there are European examples that go far off. You look at the numbers for Portland or for major cities where a percent of bike, uh, people who are cyclists getting to work, and yes, they are higher, and sometimes it's weather, sometimes it's infrastructure, but we're not, you know, it's not like we are so far behind. We are far behind on our infrastructure, to Paul's point, but you know, it's not like it's pie in the sky will never reach there. I mean, it, you know, you look at European cities like Paris, they still have 60 plus percent driving. Even in these cities, London is the same, even with the congestion tolls, even with these, um, with their great metro systems and whatnot. So I guess, you know, going to Paul's point, like, yes, it's about infrastructure, but it's also about being realistic and, and I guess, 
realizing that we're not that far. It's policy oriented. Like you, you know, Paris didn't put in a lot. They put in a, a bike share program. They put in some bike lanes, but a lot of it was about education and as much about the drivers. I mean, they said the first day was sort of chaos. The first week. You know, a year later, people were learning because there were more bikes on the, the roads. Not necessarily a ton more bike infrastructure, except the bike share program. So thinking like how the policy, so yeah, it's about infrastructure, but you talked about how do you change that hope. It's also about ways of thinking of it. And you still have to answer the parking issue for those issues. <laughs> so uh, uh, do you guys want to respond to that, or do you? And, and yeah, I mean, from the GO stations, a lot of it is because we also had someone from Metro Lakes, I don't want to wait him to say it, is that Metro Lakes does want a place for people to park. You also have people, you will always have people drive. Those who choose because they can. Those who feel they have the income to support that and they know that you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, less of a person. Um, and also, certain times of the year, you're just, I know, like, I don't bike all year long. I will drive certain places and I understand not that parking infrastructure are expensive. But it's kind of thing you, you work with the metrics of cost of parking, see if you can pay that over time. Uh, if you can, because if you can't, I mean, people downtown in Carnival can pay for spots on the condos for 30, 40 grand. Uh, they might be willing to pay $3 a month to park their car at uh, a go. I'm not saying I love the realization of that because I, I don't want to. Um, but the other thing to look at is if, if you build the buildings a bit like the build uh, schools in Sweden, they know that schools. You know, populations in areas are, when they have the flow, they grow and they, they get smaller. And there's not always just like the GTA in downtown, there's not the same amount of kids now as it will be in 15 years. Say about Queen and Strong, it'll be all pictures and, you know, you know professionals. So, well, they just are schools too, though. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> yeah. They have a chance. Um, so, what they do with these schools is when there's a lack of population of kids, they pre engineered the schools to be converted to college. So they're already roughed in for, now I know that has cost, but what you're doing is you're leveraging that, that capital and that investment to do something in the future. Like you see the brickworks, right? This is a great example of um, to reclaim the space. And if you could build those structures in such a way that they could be converted later, this is something you have to completely engineer. Uh, it's one way to approach building a structure like that. All right. Uh, Nancy, Nancy's up with uh, the next grill. Okay, thanks. It's like a dragon stand up. Yeah. <laughs> it's a like rock and you zero money. So. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's hard to be last because there's so much that I want to say that I want to talk about what everybody said. Um, but I'll start with the, um, and I'll start with the, uh, the, your presentation. And one thing that, I, you know, that I was really um, pleased about was the, all of the talk about complete streets, because from our perspective at TCAT, that's that's something that we've been advocating for for three years now, and it's we really feel like it's got a very um, that it's it has a lot of um, legs in terms of you know we've seen the policy movement across the U.S. There's over 350 policies developed there, and we're really trying to get that same kind of movement happening in Canada. So I'm really glad to see this kind of language being used because I think that it, it really helps to uh, depoliticize the topic. Um, so we're kind of all in this in this situation together. And, and similarly, you know, it's funny this this idea of you know cyclists and pedestrians and drivers and and it's this kind of weird thing that we do in North America, which is like really not, you know, in European cities it's like, what what is that? What are you talking about? You're a cyclist. It's like I use my bike to get to work. It's not like I identify as as that. You know, it's like this funny thing that we do that I'd love to see us kind of move beyond that. And I think that this is one way to, to do that is by start to use this kind of language of complete streets. Um, and just just in terms of what what Paul's saying too, I mean I think that the we do have really lots of great examples um, in the GTA of complete streets. And I think that the issue is really how do we make this happen on a routine basis? So that it's not just a one-off, it's not like, you know, when someone donates a million dollars to the city, it's like, you know, we, we work this out every time. It's like part of part of business as usual. And we I, I think so I think the policy is is really important, so I was glad to see that, that you have that in there. Um, so but one thing that kind of concerned me that I wanted to mention was there's, there's a lot of talk, and I think every everybody ahead of me kind of said something similar, like, 
about that it's not necessarily about bike lanes and we don't necessarily need bike infrastructure. And from our perspective at TCAT, it's like bikes are the one um, one mode that have been like routinely ignored and left out of the equation. And it do, it's true it doesn't always need to be bike lanes, but I think particularly in, um, a, in a municipality like Markham, which actually has the second worst active transportation rate in the country, um, is, you know, it's been developed in such a horrible way that just to try to, you know, think about the idea of shared streets or, you know, it's just like, it's just not a go. When you've got that kind of volume and speed of, um, of cars, I think that it's, that I just don't think that we're at that place, maybe down the road, when we calm the traffic and reduce the traffic. But I think, you know, when we're talking about streets like we have in Markham, I think that it's, um, um, that we really need to be looking at bike lanes. So I don't know if you want to respond to that. It wasn't really a question, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I agree. I totally agree. I think the point um, <clears throat> we were trying to make is, uh, well, how I interpreted that that uh, that line was that it's about the right mode for the right choice, and it's about all modes, and it's about thinking about uh, how to accommodate all the modes. And, and the driver was health, and that we felt that walking is an immediate capability for maybe more people than biking might be. So, of course, um, I didn't think that biking isn't important. Um, I think it was uh, an inclusivity, trying to think of, of how, um, how everything works together as a designer, looking at what, what you have and what you need and what you want. So I totally agree. Do we have, you know, there's one more, both of you, quick questions because we got to wrap it up and get to, uh, we got to take a break. Yeah, here. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I can say one last thing here, uh, which really bugs the hell out of me. About six weeks ago, I wrote a big piece for the Insight Saturday session of the Star. Some of you might have read it. I basically asked the question, what if you couldn't drive? How would you conduct your daily life? Right? And I went through, how many people under 16 obviously don't drive? A lot of seniors don't drive. But you, you know what? About 35% of the, uh, 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 of the uh, uh, population of the old city of Toronto doesn't drive. They don't even have a license, right? They never even had a license, right? And we make this assumption that everybody drives all the time. We've got to accommodate the car. Well, I think that's bullshit. Uh, that's the first point. The, the second thing is, I, I talked about in that example, in terms of buckets making it personal, right? So let me ask you, uh, pose this question to you. How would you what, what would your answer be if I said to you, how would you like half a million dollars in your RRSP, five more years of healthy life, right? And uh, you know, time to do all kinds of things that you wish. Who would you say yes, right? You know where I got those numbers? From the Canadian Automobile Association. Because the average cost of owning a car, a Dodge Caravan in Toronto, is $12,000 a year all in. Everything. Amortization, parking, the whole deal. That's what the reality is on their website, right? If you, if you multiply it over a 40 year working life from 25 to 65, it's half a million bucks for one crappy Dodge Caravan. <laughs> if you own two cars, you are blowing a million dollars out of your pocket, right? For the purpose of having something that eventually is worth nothing, right? Just a minute. And the, the, the second thing is about time. I worked out the math. If you spend an hour a day in gridlock over a working life that's equal to one entire calendar year sitting on the Queen Elizabeth Way. If it's two hours a day, it's two years, it's three hours, it's three years. Time. And the third thing is health, the focus of this topic tonight. Right? You're supposed to walk 10,000 steps a day, right? You know, ideally you maintain good health and all that stuff. Well, if you're sitting in gridlock, you're not walking very much. So the reality, when you add all that up, that's very personal stuff, right? So that's an important thing. The last comment I want to make, and then you can respond to this, is I call this moving minds. That's what we've got to move, uh, as well as people in transit and all this other stuff. And I run, when I had this article appear in the, as a 
whole front page of the Insight section of the Star. What was the headline on the front page of the Star? It was about the region of York where the leaders up there, I'm not getting personal, I'm just using practical examples that were in the paper, said, well, we know sprawl is bad, but we've got to keep doing it because we need the money. Like, the mindset, the lack of political leadership, you know, so that's why I'm frustrated. Moving minds, educating, making them personal. So I appreciate any observations you have, because to me it's part of the strategy of trying to you know, make this stuff happen. Um, well, again, I have to agree with everything you said. And <laughs> I'm not going to put up in the yell that if you don't. So. <laughs> but I'm going to No, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I grew up in a household full of cars, but I thought to because I was just thinking I grew up at 16, I had a car to drive. But I never owned a person, and I don't really want one. Uh, but here, here, here's an example of something that's change, and I don't mean to do a company to one, but I am going to. Um, the company I work for, Grinning Homes, we are a sustainable renovator. But we go further than that and we try to look at reducing the amount of, um, so the impact we have on our total operations. So we're probably the only construction company where there's only two drivers. The other 13 staff take TTC and are mandated to cycle to cycle work. And the way we do that is we make choices in taking clients. And you know, we only take things that are accessible by TTC lines. And I know that, that it came up when I was looking for work, my partner looked for work. And she now commutes to uh, Burlington, so she spends two hours a day on the highway. Um, and I think it's, like you're right, it's making a choice. Do you want half a million dollars? And for me, I'm working you know, um, in a city where I can bike and, and transit, and I think it's, it is making it personal um, and trying to make a difference. I mean, it's not easy running a construction business company with no trucks. Um, but, you, but you leverage your assets. You uh, reduce the cost for clients. You make you know, standard deliveries. And you're more well organized. And when you have a car, you can drive all, all over the place. I go to my parents' house and I drive all over the city because there's no bike lanes. And to get to my parents' house is like an hour and 20 minutes. Um, but I think you make life choices. The reason why you live downtown is so you can take transit and bike. And um, I don't have anything to do with the suburb, but it is making it personal. So maybe it's like the one ads. Like, do you want to stay home, not leave your house, make half a million dollars, and live five years longer? Call this number. And I'll give them your number. I think now in the Iowa River, the grid and I would really like those kind of ads in the back of their paper. <laughs> Anyways, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to uh, end this uh, presentation here. We've got to take a few minutes to set up for the next one, and we're gonna repeat this whole process again with another presentation. So, we've got a couple of minutes to mill around here. I believe there's some water in the back, and uh, yeah, we'll be back in a few minutes.